But it's a joy to be with you. If you take your Bibles, we're going to start in Luke 1. And all this uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday are six sessions. We have four talls and two shorts. Last night was a short, uh, to use Starbucks language, and Monday morning will be short, and then talls are right now full length. Uh, But for the next 35, 40 minutes or so, what we're going to do is look at the original settings. Now, what I'm saying to you is we, as priesthood of believers, which we are, we stand before the Lord, and we're to examine everything like Bereans, Acts 17.11. And so I would like to just go back this weekend to the original settings, not to Christianity like it is in the 21st century. Uh, In fact, someone was asking me, they said they have a relative that's going to be coming to Kalamazoo, and what are the churches in Kalamazoo like? I said, oh, they're really interesting. Uh, They're ordaining women, and they're saying it's okay that uh, homosexuals can be married because they love each other and they're faithful. And, And what's nice about that is it's all nice. It's just not biblical. And see, the people in the churches nowadays don't know the Bible. In fact, you know what's worse? Young people can't tell if what they know about Moses is from a Disney movie or from one of those veggie tale things or from the Bible because they don't really have a grasp of God's Word. It used to be even in literature, English literature. It was sprinkled with the Bible. I mean, all these sayings, handwriting on the wall, right out of, you know, Daniel chapter 5. But nobody knows that anymore. And so what are the original settings? What does it say in the Scripture? Well, basically this, and let me uh, keep posted here. We have a, uh, a mechanista that fix my slides for me, and I am so thankful for people that understand Max. But the wonder of salvation in Luke chapter 1. And basically this, I would like to rehearse with you what we all believe the God's Word says about who's saved, who's not, and how they got saved, and what they were like before they were saved, and what they were like after they're saved. Now, we're an old-fashioned church in Kalamazoo. When we baptize people, they get up and they say three things. That they were born into this world a poor, lost, dead pagan. They heard the gospel and were saved. And this is what God has done since. Do you know salvation means we were born needing to be saved, lost. There is a point when we were born again. Now, if I ask any of you when you were born, you wouldn't say, I'm not sure it was over like a one-year, two-year period. Come on. Honestly, what would you think if someone said that to you? You say, when were you born? I don't know, sometime between 65 and 68. You'd go, really? Does your mother know that? You know, (laughs) Your mother knows it was a very dramatic, maybe 18-hour labor would be on the high end, you know, but it happened, right? What is salvation? Well, look at chapter 1 of Luke. And this is, of course, the Benedictus. This is, this is uh, in, the, in the Vulgate, it's called that. This is Zacharias' prophecy of John the Baptist's ministry heralding Christ. I know that it's a Christmas story. But look what he says about salvation. Verse 77. To give knowledge of salvation, there's what we're looking at, the wonder of salvation, to his people. What, what does salvation mean? Through the remission of of their sins, remission, the sending away of the debt of sin. Now, we're all sinners, and sin has to be paid for by someone. Only two choices, me or Christ. And if I am saved, my sins have to be remitted. You know, it's an accounting term. They have to be put into some column. And someone, they can't just be forgotten. See, that's the problem with American, uh, what are we at? How many trillions? I think the debt clock has stopped, if you guys are watching the news. It hasn't moved forward. The big one that shows how many trillions Americans owe, it's, it's been frozen for over 180 days. Either the government's not spending or someone needs to plug it back in. But we look at those trillions of dollars, and to us it's an incomprehensible number, and we just think we don't even know about it. It's just some generation is going to pay for it. We almost think about that about sin. We say, oh, God just forgives them. He just forgets. No. Everything has to be paid for. Salvation is, the remission of sin is, that the moment that I was saved, I was like this, my sin was on me, and the instant I got saved, my whole block of sin went on Jesus Christ. And God treats Jesus on the cross like He committed every sin I have ever committed or will commit. You understand, if you understand salvation, 
that Jesus hung on the cross, and every time we've ever sinned, lied, stolen, cheated, been proud, been unchristlike in any way, God treated Christ on the cross like He was that way. For every person, for every sin, for everyone who will ever place their faith in Jesus Christ, God treats Jesus like He committed my sins. Whoa, that's remission. Now, that's only the beginning of salvation. That's, by the way, the doctrine of justification, which involves the remission of sins. Through the tender mercies, now I'm reading verse 78 of Luke 1, the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high hath visited us. Jesus came to bring the dawning of a new day to, to lost people. That's what day spring, you know, that's sunrise, you know, to use non New King James Version. Verse 79, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Whoa. Do you know what the Bible says? It says all of us were born blind in the darkness, spiritually blind, unable to, to find God on our own, and we are sitting in the darkness awaiting destruction. In fact, Jesus graphically says that, that we are over this chasm that is a bottomless pit that is the blackness of darkness where everybody that falls into that pit suffers the vengeance of eternal fire. That's called Gehenna, hell, lake of fire, whatever term you want to use, the, the everlasting death. But look what Jesus does. He gives light, verse 79, to us who are sitting in darkness. So here we are sitting in darkness, walking every day of our life toward the edge where we're going to tumble over the cliff into this bottomless pit of everlasting destruction. And Jesus shines, in fact, Wesley put it this way, Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, went forth, and followed thee. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. That's how he describes salvation. Did you know that's where we were when we were born into this world? In the dark headed for the pit. And when the day spring from on high shines on us, and, and by the way, God initiates, He shines. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray, that good, uh, uh, you know, uh, non-reformed Wesley said, you know, Wesley was not very reformed, but his theology sure was. And God diffused the quickening ray, and He responded in faith. That's salvation. And when that happens the remission of sin takes place. So that's salvation. So just in your mind, all of us going to heaven were born lost. We did not get saved because we were born into a Christian family or because our parents sprinkled us or because we went through confirmation. That none of those, let's go back to the original settings, none of those are in the Bible. What the Bible says is we're born lost and we are born dramatically as dramatic as the first birth was is the second birth and in that instant our eyes by the way seven things happen did you know that seven instantaneous things happen it says in acts 26 18 because jesus told paul how he saved him and he said his eyes were opened before we are saved, our eyes are closed. We can't see God. We can't understand the Bible. In fact, the problem nowadays is there are millions of churchgoers that can't understand the Bible because their eyes are closed. They've never been saved. They go to church. They think they're a Christian because they're like a car. If you go in a garage, you're not a car just because cars go in garages. And people go to churches, they think they're Christians because they go to church. No, the only way to be a Christian is your eyes have to be open. And only God can open your eyes. Pastors can't, parents can't. God opens eyes, turns us, turns us from going toward the darkness to no longer loving the darkness and turns us toward himself. He is the light. But that's salvation. And that's the wonder of our salvation. But once we're saved, that's the original setting of salvation, God implants within us a hunger and a thirst for him. Blessed are those, Sermon on the Mount says, who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they'll be filled. As newborn babes, we saw last night, 1 Peter 2, 2, desire, hunger for the pure milk of the Word. Well, let's go to Mark 2 and verse 20, because what, what is amazing uh, about the Scriptures is that it tells us that God has an original setting uh, for us, this hungering, 
And in Mark 2.20, Jesus uses a term. Let, let me just read this, 2.20 to you. It says, but the days will come. By the way, it's, they're asking him about fasting in verse 18. By the way, fasting. When's the last time, other than the five families from Calvary, that you heard a full Sunday morning sermon on fasting? Hold your hand up. And I, good. Good. About 5% at the max. Maybe 4%. Did you know biblical fasting characterized the ancient church? And I'm not talking about a diet fast to start eating grain and nuts and stay away from trans fats and chemicals and all that. I'm talking about not health and weight changes, but a spiritual discipline, which was, Paul said, I fast more than all the rest of you. And Paul, we know, got more done than all the rest of us have ever gotten done. And there's something about it. But where do you get his fasting from? Well, look at verse 18. The disciples were asking. I'm in Gospel by Mark, chapter 2, verse 18. The disciples of John, the Pharisees, were fasting. So all those everybody fasted back then to differing degrees. And then they came to him and said, Why do the disciples of John, the Baptist, and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples, Jesus, don't fast? So that's a good question. And, and I think a lot of New Testament believers think fasting is Old Testament. And it was in the Old Testament. But look what Jesus does with it. Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom... Okay, everybody look up from your Bible. Let's do a little code of the Bible. Who is the bridegroom in the Bible? Jesus. Okay. So the friends of the bridegroom, Jesus is saying, I'm the bridegroom, my friends are my disciples. Okay, so just so you go with the code. Can the friends of the bridegroom, that's the disciples, the bridegroom's Christ, fast while their bridegroom, that's Christ, is with them? Jesus said, how can they be fasting? I'm here. As long as they have the bridegroom, that's Jesus, with them, they cannot fast. Now look at verse 20. This is a staggering verse in the Bible. Jesus is speaking. If you have a red letter Bible, it's in red. By the way, all of it should be in red because Jesus inspired all the scriptures. Peter said the Spirit of Christ was in all the prophets. So it should all be red, but some are red red. That means he actually said them. He didn't just inspire them. But look at verse 20. Jesus said, but the days will come when the bridegroom, who is that? Jesus, will be taken away from them. What was that? When was the bridegroom taken away from the disciples? When did Jesus leave the disciples? We call that the what? Ascension, yeah. At first, you know, he was crucified, buried, risen. They were all excited. He was around for 40 days after the resurrection. Then he takes him up on the mountain called Olivet, and while, they, while he was talking to them, in fact, it said he was blessing them. Boy, that is one of the, We go every year to Israel, and we're going next month, and, and that's one of my favorite stops. We, we go to Mount of Olives, and I see the disciples were just standing around Jesus, radiantly filled with joy. He was talking to them, and he was blessing them. He was saying stuff to them. He was saying, boy, Peter, you were the best. And John, you've been so close to me. And Matthew, I'm so glad you left your career and followed me. And he went like that. And all of a sudden, while he was talking, he started going... And it says he began to ascend, but he didn't stop talking. He was raining down blessings on them. It was kind of like he was saying, you know, don't forget what I told you. I'm going to be with you all the time, and I, you know, I designed you for great things. And he's going up, and he, look back at verse 20, the day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. So that's the ascension. Now what does the end of verse 20 say? The, the followers of Christ, the disciples of Christ, the Christians, the believers, after Jesus ascends into heaven, then they will fast in those days. What is fasting? Fasting is looking and longing for Christ. They were looking up and remembering Him as He went up out of sight And they were longing because he promised he would come back for them. And they didn't know when he was coming. It was kind of like when I was little at at Hazlitt Elementary School, my mom would say if I had an after school thing, she said, now you stand right by the door, don't go out too far, anybody might steal you, and you look for me, and when I pull up, you come out to the car. But you kind of stay in the safe school, and you look for me. And so I'd stand at the door, and I'd be looking, and any scary people, I'd get back in the school, and I'd look. And when I saw you know, our old car coming, it was ours, I'd rush out, but I long to be picked up 
by the one I love. Jesus said fasting is the internal longing we have because we can't wait for Jesus to come get us and we want to be found by him doing what he left us to do here. Now, is that something that's a part of the fabric of your life? Do you regularly deny yourself good things? Is there anything wrong with food? No. Is there anything wrong with watching football games? Yes or no, answer immediately. No, there's nothing. Is there anything wrong with watching the Home Shopping Network? Yes or no? No. <laughs> no, in and of itself, biblically, there is nothing wrong with watching the news, with watching games. Now, there are some things on TV that are cultic you shouldn't watch, that are you know, immoral that you shouldn't watch. God has already clearly said all that. But just, I mean, just watching, you know, 112 hours of Olympic coverage. Is there anything wrong with that? No. But if it pushes out time with God, then it's sin. Actually, it's not just wrong, it's sin. And see, fasting is that I fast from anything that pushes God out of the center of my life. Okay, let's talk about early believers. And early believers focused on eternal ministry. And basically what I mean by that is we read the book of Acts and we see people that were going everywhere. In fact, the book of Acts has over 30 different Greek words for communication. They talked about God. They spoke about God. They enthusiastically declared God. They witnessed about God. They boldly, triumphantly stood as heralds. There are 30 different Greek words for the communication of Christ. That meant they're different than us. Because right now, about 90% of all Christians never share the gospel verbally with anyone. They're all secret agents, like they all work for the NSA, you know, and it's to totally classified who they are and what they do. And they don't talk about it. But they did. But early believers did talk. And they talked about God because they were hungering. They were knowing the bridegroom is gone and knowing he's returning and they longed and hungered for him today because they wished that it was that they could walk through like the old days with him, uh, those early disciples, but since they couldn't, they just longed for him all day long and that longing led them back to the Word of God, led them to prayer, led them to this life of resting in God. That's... But we need to ask ourselves, do we have that? I mean, honestly. Can you remember the last time, not yesterday, but the last time you were drawn like, like to the Word of God, just like a magnet drawing a metallic object, like that. You ever played with a magnet? and You can get that object, and all of a sudden, poof, it just comes. And the stronger the magnet... Do you have a magnetic attraction to God's Word? By the way, this is the only way to know God. You don't know God by looking at the clouds. and There is, there is general revelation that kind of has this, this kind of sketchy, you can kind of see God out there, but this is the specific direct revelation. The only way that you know that, that, that anything you've heard about God is true is if it's in the Bible. See, we're living in this age where people say, well, God told me this. I say, oh, great, let me find it. Uh, because if God told you something, it is absolutely true, and it will happen, and I'm going to see, where is that? I'm a Berean Christian. I'm going to search the Scriptures to see if that's... Well, they said, well, he didn't tell it to me that way. What it means is I kind of feel that. I said, oh, I don't mind. I feel a lot of stuff too. Do you know what God has said? This is the definition. The Bible is defining the true and living God. If you don't have this, then how do you know that the Allah of the Islam is not the, the Lord of the Bible? What defines who God is? How about the God of, of, of you know, the way out fringy Christians? How do you know who God is? It's defined by the Scriptures. Search the Scriptures. In them you find that you have eternal life. Well, what is fasting in the Old Testament? It was one day a year. Okay, let's be specific. The Jews had to fast one day a year. And it was one day that they had this, this national fast and, and it was a, a day that everyone was hungry all day long, and the kids were saying, how much longer before we get to eat? And the parents said, we have to do it. It's a biblical holiday. 
And it was an annual event to get serious about God. And we no longer uh, have the Mosaic Law forcing us to have one day fasting. Isn't that a blessing? To not be under the bondage of Moses. In the New Testament, though, biblical fasting was that ancient spiritual discipline where they rescheduled regularly their life. What they did is they said, I'm going to fast from anything that is, that is edging God out of the center. See, priority means there's only one thing that can be the priority. And God says, I'm the priority. But what we do in the 21st century is we have multiple priorities. We have our health. You know, I've got to run every day, and I've got to lift every day, and I've got to, you know, stretch every day. We have that up there. We've got our career. You know, I've got to keep up with my career. We've got our family, you know, and I've got to do all this stuff. And we've got, you know what I mean, all the, and God and the church, and we have all this on the same shelf. God says, I'm the top, and all other shelves are below that. And you seek me first. Seek ye first, Matthew 6, 33. The kingdom, the rule of God, and everything else will be added unto you. And the New Testament fasting was a regular way to reschedule life that God was at the center of the top shelf. Instead of everything else, like I showed you last night, dining. Some people, their whole, they live for eating, relaxing. It's like, it's like people live for... Did you know most people at the peak of their lives go into perpetual relaxation? They call it retirement. And they, we have some of the key people in the world who have lived their lives for the Lord. They know more about the Bible. And right when they have less work responsibilities and they could pour themselves into young couples or young people or Sunday school or missions, they have the dream of their life to move to a, you know, Arizona or California or Alabama or somewhere, Gulf Shores somewhere, and go play golf at the peak of their life. When they have less financial obligations, uh, they have more finances. You know, they're they're at that 55 to 70 year old thing where they're loaded. Most of them, uh, you bump into them all over if you travel. I do. I mean, we just bumped into someone in Canada. They have this elaborate Canadian cottage with multiple levels and hot tubs and views and everything, and they they jet between there and Vancouver and Florida and who knows where else. They're at their peak. They've got all these retirement payments and annuities and stock and everything. And where is God in all that? When they could be investing the majority of their life into the Lord, they go off somewhere for relaxing. Amazing. That's the American dream, by the way, I just said. Advancing, securing, everything else. They're, these are all deadly to intimacy with God. He says, you have to seek me first. We're going to see later in the early church, biblical fasting shaped their lives. Did you know that the whole church in Antioch got together in Acts and prayed because they had two young men in the church that wanted to go on a missions trip, and the church said, we're not going to send them unless we pray and fast. It's interesting, in the early church, fasting and prayer went together. They were kind of like Siamese twins. And they said, this Barnabas and this Paul guy... We don't know if we're going to send them out. We're going to see if the Lord wants to send them out. Did you know the whole church gathered to fast and pray before they launched a missionary off on a journey? Can you imagine how it would revolutionize people going into missions if people fasted and prayed for a, in a long period of time? A church, I don't mean the missions committee, I mean the whole church was so engaged. They said, we want to support, we want to send out, we want to be a part of this. We're going to deny ourselves so we can send them out it shaped their lives basically what they were saying is fasting is a way to yield every part of my life in fact i used to travel paul said i used to travel with john MacArthur uh, on the road we called it on the road we travel all over um and he was asked to speak all kinds of places and he would bring a team of men with him and, and we would go and usually like one time they this place we went to speak they presented him a lobster you could hold both of the lobster claws and the lobster tail was way down to here. I mean, that is a good-sized lobster. And they would always honor him. They would give him an oversized steak. And he would eat away. You know, he was very friendly and kind to everybody. But I would sit next to him, and he'd eat away, and he'd leave the best part of whatever he was eating, you know, like that, that very tenderest part of the steak or that very best part of the lobster or, if you're eating a hot fudge sundae, that column that has, you know, the whipped cream and the nuts and lots of chocolate and then that 
rich, and then all the stuff underneath. He would leave a whole column, and I'd say, John, what's wrong? Don't you know the kids are starving in India? Didn't your mother ever tell you that? He says, yeah, he says, but I always leave part of my food to remind my body it's not in, in charge. See, a lot of people, our body dictates everything. If we're tired, we don't want to do it. If we're sore, we don't want to do it. If we don't feel well, we don't want to do it. Our body drives everything. Paul said, no, I bring my body into subjection. I don't want my body running the show. That's what fasting is, yielding every part of my life, every part under the rule of the Lord. And so biblical fasting and this whole idea of hungering after God is a way we declare our allegiance. So back to the original setting. Look at Mark 2 and verse 20. Jesus said, then they will fast in those days. That's us. That's the church age. The church age is the time between Christ's ascension and his return. And during that period, those believers, Jesus said, would long for his coming and would fast. Does that mean we stop eating? No. It means we live a lifestyle of making sure regularly that everything in our life is under the supremacy, the rule of Christ. Is my life uh, prepped for what He wants to do with me? And any part of me that's not ready, I want it to be ready. That's the supremacy of Christ. Okay, let's see what happened. What happened, I always love to look in the Bible and see this. To the people who heard Jesus say this, and to the people who heard the apostles repeat it, what did their lives look like? That's what we have here. That's what the record is. The first audience that heard this message, how did they live? And let me just show you one, one little snippet. Okay, this is from Aristides. Aristides was a philosopher. Uh, Hadrian was the emperor in 133, if you see up there the date. And Hadrian was the builder, if you ever heard of the Pantheon. He did a lot of stuff. Tivoli, you know, Villa de Est, all this stuff. Hadrian, though, Hadrian's wall that's still across England. If you go from Britain to Scotland, you cross the wall. He was a big builder. Hadrian was orderly. And he said, there's something going on in the emperor, empire. He said, there's this whole group of people, and they're not... They're not bearing arms against us, but they don't do our stuff. They don't like going to the arena. They don't like watching people getting eaten. Everybody else loves to watch the, the gladiatorial bloody games. They don't like it. They don't go to the, a lot of the stuff. There, there were so many festivals in Rome that were what the Bible would call immoral that the Christian population began to, to not participate in a lot of those things. So Adrian said, who are these people? They're growing. Are they dangerous? And so he sent Aristides, a philosopher, to penetrate them like a spy and to write an analysis of them. And this is the analysis. It's very interesting. And it's very long. I only pulled out the part that I wanted you to see. And there is among them a man that is poor and needy, and they have not an abundance of necessities. They fast two or three days that they might supply the needy with their necessary food. You know what he said that the average first century Christian was characterized by? This is an unsafe pagan philosopher looking at Christianity. He said these people, especially if anybody that's a Christian is in need, they personally don't eat for three days to save up three days worth of money for food to help them out. Now let me ask you, when you see people you know, at the off-ramps of the highway with their cardboard signs going, do you think of, I'm not going to eat lunch, I'm going to give them money? Is that the first thought? Come on, for all of us. Do you know who I'm talking about? Do you guys ever see people with the cardboard signs? How many of you have seen someone with a cardboard sign that says, God bless, out of work? You know, this, by the way, that I'm teaching, we've been doing this for a whole year at Calvary. And, you know, the, the spiritual health and fitness and the praying and the fasting and the resting. And you know, I kept teaching it, and one of our young couples in the young marriage class uh, sent me a note, and they said that they were hearing all this, and, and that Jesus, you know, had such compassion. So this medical professional, on his way home, was, was at the light where you have to stop, and one of those people held up the little cardboard sign, and they had a little girl standing next to him. It might have been their daughter. He didn't know. So he put his window down, and they walked toward him, and he said, hey, are you really in need? And they said, yeah. And he said, are you hungry? And they said, yeah. 
And he said, do you want to come home with me for dinner? And they said, they looked at each other, and the dad said to the daughter, do you really want to go with him? She said, I would. And they got in the back seat of their car, and he calls his wife. He said, hey, honey, we have two more for supper. Now let me ask you, how many in this room have ever done that? Do you know what he said in his note to the church? He said, you know what I found out? Those people with signs, most of them are not rapists. Most of them are not murderers. Most of them are not, you know, somebody that's going to just kill you in your bed, the night stalker. He said it was a guy who came on hard times and his power was turned off in his house and, and he used all of his money to get the power on. He didn't have money for food, so he decided he sees everybody else doing it, so he'd stand with a sign and try and get some money. And so now... This couple in our church have organized and they're trying to help him and his car is in, you know. I mean, he's got a multitude of problems. He's not a Christian. And his car, I don't know, he didn't pay the taxes on I don't know what. But all I'm saying is that, that the early church was characterized by Christ's primary emotion. Do you know what Jesus' primary emotion was? Compassion. In the Gospels, the most recorded emotion Jesus exhibited was compassion. Is that how most people would characterize us? You are driven by compassion, new. We're driven by security, comfort, and convenience. Those are the three lusts of America. We want to be secure, we want to be comfortable, and we want everything to be convenient. Everything has to be easy to get to, drive up, or you know, come and go from. We want security, comfort, and convenience. And those people are not any of those things. Well, watch this. Look at Philippians 3. Remember I told you, what did the first century look like interpreting, living this out? Philippians 3 starting in verse 19. This is what the Apostle Paul says. Here are the lost people. He contrasts what we used to be with what we are now. Whose end is destruction. That's the end of every lost person. They're headed for destruction. Whose God is their belly. They live for their appetites, their bodies. I'm in Philippians 3.19. Whose glory is in their shame. By the way, on Sunday, last Sunday, uh, last Sunday I was... um, standing at a purveyor of vitamin C. I call coffee vitamin C. And I was at a purveyor of vitamin C. And there was the New York Times, where you get your vitamin C, your coffee. There's a stack of newspapers in a rack. And the headlines of the New York Times was sitting there, and I thought it was curious. It was the front page. It was a man who graduated from West Point, I think. If I, you know, I didn't buy the paper, so I, didn't, I just read it, you know. Uh, and so I didn't get all the details, but it, I think it was a man that graduated from West Point who went into becoming a judicial you know, judge, and now, for the last 30 years, has been a woman and was the pioneer of transgenderism. A, is West Point Army? Army. Isn't it? Okay. An Army man, officer is now the highest circuit court in the country woman judge and has done everything you need to do to morph into that. Now look at, and this was the front and center, a picture this big of this man that looks like a woman. And and look what it says in Colossians that characterizes the world, whose glory is in their shame. This person denied the way God created them and went through every possible opportunity to become what God did not genetically make them. And now they are, and what the New York Times says is, this woman is a hero because of the pain they've gone through in culture. But now they have, you know, through the recent Supreme Court edict, They are glorified that they're a pioneer. Whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind, and here's the real key. I wasn't even trying to get to that. I'm getting the end of verse 19. Who set their mind on earthly things. So the primary description of of what a lost person is, is they only live for the earth. Their glory is in their body, in their shame, they, they are proud of their sin, and they're living for the earth. Now look at verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, 
from which we also eagerly wait. Do you see the, the Mark 2.20? That they're going to fast longing for Christ's return. Paul said, that's what I am. I'm actually living on earth, but I'm a citizen of heaven. I eagerly am waiting for my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that's going to transform my lowly body that it can be conformed to His glory. Wow. The Apostle Paul said this, the longing for heaven shaped his life. He says, I'm eagerly waiting for Christ's return. Philippians 3.19, fasting caused them, New Testament saints, to eagerly wait for Christ. Uh, as long as you're in Philippians, look at 1 Thessalonians 1. This is a constant theme. I mean, you're there. Go to the right with me. Philippians, Colossians, then 1 Thessalonians. It's to the right. Chapter 1, verse 10. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Do you see what prompted the, the New Testament saints? They longed for Christ's return. They, they wanted their life to be waiting for his coming, for his finding them as a good and faithful servant. Do you remember what Jesus said? He says, I want to be able to say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. I gave you a few things you were entrusted with and you were faithful, and now I'll give you many things because you're a good and faithful servant. What, what did they say in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10? We are waiting for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, and He's the one who delivers us from the wrath to come. He has saved us, and we long for heaven. Well, guess what? That's how the early church was in the first generation. They were just, in the book of Acts, talking to anybody that they could. They were suffering whatever it cost. They were living in, in whatever town they lived in in the Roman Empire. They were living waiting for Jesus. They were saying, I'm a citizen of heaven. But something dulled their passion. And, and now we're getting to Revelation. Go with me to Revelation 3. Um, last book of the Bible, third chapter. Because how do we go from the enthusiasm of the book of Acts, from the People loving the Lord of the early church in Acts and the Epistles, a contagious love for Jesus, a fearless proclamation of his truth. But then, if you've read Revelation, most of us have caught that something changed. In fact, you know what Revelation 2 and 3 are all about? Jesus goes on a tour, you know, unseen. He goes incognito, and he visits a circle of, Literally, on a map, if you chart Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, you know, all the way through, if you go all the way through the seven churches, it's actually a circular route, followed the postal route of the ancient world. And Jesus went to each of these churches, seven of them. Why seven? Because John, who wrote Revelation, was heptatic. He does everything in sevens. There, in the Gospel of John, there's seven I am's of Christ, and seven sign miracles, and seven titles of Christ. I mean, there's just seven, seven, seven. He, heptatic means in sevens. Revelation's more heptatic. I mean, seven seals, seven bulls, seven trumpets, you know, seven angels, seven this, seven horns. It's just sevens. What is seven for? God invented sevens. Hey, think of this. There's no anthropological, paleoanthropological reason that every one of us live with a calendar of seven-day weeks. Seven is not divisible into anything. I mean, other than, you know, 350 or 49. I mean, but, but sevens? What is seven? God says, I work six days, I rested the seventh, now you're going to have a week of sevens. That's the only reason for the seven-day calendar. And it's around the world. Ask someone how we got that. There's no reason mathematically, there's no reason culturally. It goes right back to Genesis 2. By the way, people are always looking for proof of the Bible. Seven-day week is one. God instituted that. Do you know what another one is? There, there's only one animal, if you can call humans animals. We're not. But if you want to call us animals, there's only one animal that can't interspecially communicate within the species. Every other creature can. I mean, you get a deer from, you know somewhere in Canada and get one from, you know, somewhere down south and you get one from Europe and you put them together and they snort and they all know what it's doing and they run together. They communicate. You get any, I mean, you get a honeybee. I have two colonies. I have Georgia bees and I have Italians. 
And my bees will wiggle and talk to each other, and they all go the same way. They know, they can communicate, even though they're from all over the world. You get humans from two different countries, they can't communicate. Why can humans not communicate? There's only one reason, Genesis 11. God confused the languages. Did you know that, that uh, philologists, what do you call that, linguists, paleolinguists, the ones that study the, the, the language groups of the world, they have recently, the most recent one, has said there are 90 families. Now there are about three or four trunks of the families, but there are 90 language families that constitute the thousands of languages you know, that, that Wycliffe is translating. All those languages of the world. Why do we have so many languages? One reason. Genesis 11. God took the original language and confounded, and everyone spoke 70 languages. That was the original. Now the ethnologists and linguists say there are 90. That shows how science is. They've observed 90, but they haven't finished observing. If they keep looking, they're going to find there are really only 70. Because that's how many it says in the table of nations in Genesis 10. Okay, what cooled their passion? Look at at chapter 3 of Revelation with me and verse 15. And what, what we see is the drastic change from the first century. In only two generations, the church cooled. And Jesus is visiting these, these churches and, and he is giving them a diagnosis of their, of their sickness. Seven churches, five of them were sick. Two of them were healthy. Here is one of the sick churches. Verse 15, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Now wait a minute, look up from your Bible. Don't think cold is bad and hot is good. Because that's applying America to the Bible. In the first century, this was written to the city of what? What's, anybody know what church this is? Laodicea. Laodicea was a city that was between two other cities. It was between Colossae, like Colossians, and Hierapolis, which you know is just another city in Asia Minor. This is in Turkey. Colossae had crystal clear, cold, kind of mountain fresh spring water. They would have bottled it, you know, and sold it uh, in America. Colossae. Hierapolis to this day, is kind of like Yellowstone National Park. It's just got this bubbling cauldrons of of this hot, you know, superheated water. Laodicea had pipelines that brought water in hot from Hierapolis, cold from Colossae. But when the pipelines came in, it was neither cold nor hot. It was lukewarm because it came so far. And cold water is really good when you're hot and working. Hot water is really good after you've worked a long time and and need to relax. Lukewarm water, you're not sure quite what to do. it. Either you cool it or you heat it. And the Lord says, I know your works. You're not refreshing. You're not restorative. I wish that you were either refreshingly cold or restoratively hot, but because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, that is a very negative thing. We had eight children. There's something called projectile vomiting. How many of you have ever experienced? Yeah. It's not pleasant. That's this term. I mean, they are just expelling because it's so bad. Jesus said, you, you not being what I designed you to be, I left you to long for my return and to check in with me every day. Prayer is me checking in and saying, I want your will to be done in my life. He left us, by the way, a prayer. Remember I started the series, Hungering for God is Life, a prayer, fasting, and resting. He left the prayer, the Lord's Prayer. It's actually a disciple's prayer. Focus me on who you are. Control my life. I want to do your will. The Lord says, you're not doing that. You're not doing that. I want to vomit you out of my mouth, verse 17, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Now, what, if you want a quick summary, what was wrong with the Laodiceans? One thing. Laodiceans focused on this world, not the next. They said, hey, I've got a comfortable, convenient, secure life. I, I don't need anything. I don't need to, you know, hunger and thirst after God. I have it so good here. I don't need to be out there talking to everybody I meet about the Lord because my life is comfortable and convenient and secure and I have everything I need. 
And I'm looking only at this world. You see, if this is all we were to live for, then we should all try and be healthy and wealthy and prosperous. That should be our goal in life. If this is all there is, try and stay as healthy as possible, avoid anything that's dangerous, avoid anything that that is insecure, try and have the most wealth possible, try and have the most comfortable life, because this is all there is. But we don't believe that, do we? But yet, if the world looks at us... Did you know the pollsters, Barna and Gallup, when they look at Christians and unsaved people, they say they can't find any statistical difference. They look on money the same. They look on movies the same. They look on moral issues basically the same. There's no statistically discernible differences in the 320 or however many million Americans there are between those that claim to be Christians and those that don't. There's nothing visible between them. Why? Because the Christians are focused on this world. And Jesus is saying, I want you to be cold and going out refreshing the world with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ that Jesus saves. And I want you to be hot and passionate and and exposing evil and living for me. And you don't want to do either one. You just kind of want to have your fire insurance and go to heaven. And he says, that makes me sick. And I want to spit you out. And look at this. Verse 17 in the middle. And do not know, Revelation 3.17, that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined with fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness may be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may, be, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. The secret to what deadened, dulled, chilled, and dissipated the power of the early church is found in the doctor's report right here in Revelation 2 and 3. Jesus is the great physician. He goes and checks the health of all the churches and Revelation 2 and 3 are his findings. Well, Jesus warned that we would misplace our desires. Remember Paul said Philippians 3.18, I count everything but loss. Uh, it says in Mark 4.19 that, that the care of riches will, will be dangerous. These are enemies of our hungering for God. The enemy is comfort, convenience, security, having everything equal and God not priority. So what do we do? Well, I said it last night. We have to pray daily. Say, Lord, I want you to, change, I want you to give me a hunger after you. In fact, whenever we read the Bible, Psalm 119 verse 18 says, Open my eyes. I want to see you in this book. When we see Christ in the Bible, it changes us. The benefits are that we see the Lord and we focus on why we're here. And we begin to be mastered only by Christ. Paul said, I don't want to come under the power of anything. but I don't want my television, my computer, my digital device, my social media. I don't want anything to master me. I don't want anything to, to control me. But Christ. So my question for you is, what are you really longing for down deep? Now, my last minute. We spent a whole year on this. In fact, up in the bookstore are all 30 videos. They're, they're DVDs, five DVDs that have all 30. Only when I teach it at Calvary, they have a board about half the size that is a smart board that actually put the text on and I circle and I write the Greek words. It's really fun. So the DVDs are up there. This is a book pack. You'll find this in the bookstore. This is one book with the MP3 with it, and on the back side is this entire series in one um, disc that has all 30 messages, all 30 of the handouts, because this is for small group studies. You can actually watch the, the DVDs and fill in the blanks that, that I have right here, and these slides are on there too. But all of these things are not... By the way, uh, we sell these only to go on missions trips. Bonnie and I travel every year uh, between seven and ten weeks a year and all the people in all the conferences where we speak send us. It's really something. Uh, Every time someone buys a book we go uh, about 50 miles uh, in some direction. So uh, just for you to know, I don't profit. Camp Barakel pays me far too much to speak here. Uh, Selling, I don't need the money, it's for missions. But my question for you is, What are you hungering and longing for? This weekend is a weekend where we say, Lord, reset me back to the original settings. Amen? Let's bow for a word of prayer.
Father, I thank you that you who opened our eyes and turned us from darkness to light, you who are the sunrise from on high, you began a good work, but you want to continue that work in, a, in us. And that comes by us longing each day for you and praying for your kingdom to come in our lives and for us to reset our lives every day back to you at the center. I pray that's what you would be doing in our lives at this special weekend retreat at Barakel. For your glory we pray. In the precious name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen.